wonderful auditorium, um, and in so many ways, though, it's a very special evening and, uh, for all of you, and for me especially. Uh, of course, the opportunity to visit this wonderful campus at Vanderbilt um, is not my first visit, but it's certainly the most special one in so many ways. And my thanks, too, to Jeff Ewers, uh, who I've known for so many years, since he was about yay high, and uh, has given, given a, um, a wonderful introduction, better than anything I could have ever written myself. So, um, and I've been known to write my own introductions. Um, above all, all the folks here at the university, especially the leadership of the Holocaust Lecture Series, and especially uh, Reverend uh, Gary White and uh, Shia Bear, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure finally meeting you in person and, and getting to know you a little bit tonight, and I hope afterwards as well. But perhaps of even greater importance is the chance to remember that it was indeed precisely 90 years ago today that the guns fell silent on the Western Front, November 11, 1918. It was the end of the single bloodiest conflict ever fought until then, and though certainly no one who was present then or at the peace conference that brought a formal conclusion to that war was aware, it would simply set the stage for an even more catastrophic conflict just two decades later and the Holocaust that would accompany it. Some of those present at the conference table, at least at the outset, recognized the stakes that were involved. They were, for the most part, the young diplomats, those who realized the truly unique opportunity presented by the war that was to end all wars and the peace that was to have brought internal, eternal peace and, of course, never did, as we well know now. These young diplomats, the likes of Britain's Harold Nicholson, the American Alan Dulles, uh, he was the nephew of the Secretary of State at the time, uh, Robert Lansing, they all recognized that this was the very moment, while the 20th century was still young, to break definitively with the kind of world established by the last major international conference in 1815, the Congress of Vienna, the kind of big power rail politique that that represented. Nicholson, for one, uh, hoped to avoid the errors committed by his predecessor a century earlier, um, errors that he and many of the other younger generation of negotiators believed set up the entire power equation in Europe that had led to the outbreak in 1914 of what was then called the Great War. Uh, let me read you one passage from the extraordinary diary that Nicholson kept. Uh, I'll set the scene first. It was the, the boat train crossing the English Channel from Dover to Calais and then on to Paris by rail. Um, reflecting on his mission, um, which at that moment so excited him with anticipation, and this is what he wrote in his diary that we now have today. I felt as the train approached Saint-Denis that I knew exactly what mistakes had been committed by the misguided, the reactionary, the after all pathetic aristocrats who had represented Great Britain in 1814. At Vienna, they had believed in the doctrine of compensation. They had spoken quite cynically about the transference of souls. We, for our part, are liable to no such human error. We believe in nationalism. We believe in the self-determination of peoples. Peoples and provinces shall not be bartered about from sovereignty to sovereignty as if they were but chattels or pawns in the game. At the words pawns and chattels, our lips curl in democratic scorn. We are journeying to Paris not merely to liquidate the war, but to found a whole new order in Europe. We are preparing not peace only, but eternal peace. There is about us the halo of some divine mission. We must be alert, stern, righteous, and ascetic. For we are bent on doing great, permanent, and noble things. That's what Harold Nicholson wrote as he was en route to Paris and to this um, peace that was to result in an eternal peace, so he hoped. Noble things. But not everyone journeying to Paris was bent on such noble ends. As I write in my book, A Shattered Peace, I'm not a big believer in single causation theories of history, but I do believe that there are certain turning points. Uh, the Congress of Vienna, to which Nicholson played a, a dubious tribute, a century later the Treaty of Versailles, which he was en route to negotiate, and today we're nearly a century after that, 90 years in fact, uh, next June when it was signed, and again facing some enormous forks in the road. Each of these earlier events set the world on a path that was it was able to retrace only at the cost of enormous bloodshed and misery. There was one other young negotiator at the table when the Paris Peace Conference convened in January 1919, and indeed perhaps the most prescient of all of them. His name was John Maynard Keynes, and he took the same boat train to Paris that Nicholson took only 10 days later. Keynes spent the war assigned to the British Treasury. He was acting as the principal liaison for the Americans. 
who was a um, young Cambridge don, an economist of, of some minor renown even then. And what this really meant was that this brilliant economist was effectively the financier of much of the Allied war effort. Keynes was already a towering figure. Well, I use that quite literally. He was six feet six. So he was certainly dominated just about any room he was in in that respect. And he was well recognized for his expertise and his savoir faire. He was a member of the famous Bloomsbury crowd. If any of you um, studied English literature at all, you'll know the Bloomsbury crowd. They were led by Virginia Woolf. In fact, he'd recruited to this Bloomsbury set um, Harold Nicholson and his wife, the writer, and later lover of Virginia, by the way, Vita Sackville West. Um, throughout the war, Keynes dined regularly with these young literati and with the likes of Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher, and E.H. Lawrence, the writer. So there was a deep well of respect for this brilliant Cambridge economist in the highest levels of British and American society as well, and politics. And, and Keynes to, was able to draw on a lot of this um, as the, uh, the peace conference, uh, as the war, and then the peace conference drew on. He chose to draw on this for one principal and for our purposes this evening, most vital reason. He wanted to preserve the viability of the German state and nation. It was hard to believe, of course. After all, the principal goal of the leaders of the Allied, or at least the European powers, particularly France, was to make certain that Germany never again posed a threat to them, to the Western world, to Western Europe, to France and England and so forth. And there was lots of talk, indeed, of a Carthaginian peace What's a, do you know what a Carthaginian peace is? All right, I'll explain it. Um, no need to know. It, it refers to another peace more than 2,000 years ago, which brought an end to the um, Punic Wars when Rome defeated Carthage in 146 BC. To make certain that Carthage, Carthage never again posed a threat to Rome or any other place on Earth, uh, the Romans burned the city-state to the ground. They then plowed the remains under the ground and spread salt on the earth to make sure that nothing, not even a blade of grass, would grow there again. So this is what France, and to a lesser degree, England, sought for Germany this time after World War I. Clearly, in 1919, though, that was not really feasible. Germany was a nation, in fact, an empire, far from just a city-state like Carthage was. Still, England and France both sought reparations from Germany that would have had the impact of a Carthaginian defeat. Reparations, of course, are money, damages, uh, when something goes badly wrong, you gotta pay the price. Um, it's essential to remember the circumstances that preceded the arrival of the world leaders in Paris that January, 90 years ago. David Lloyd George was the British Prime Minister. He had recently won re-election. His platform was that he would make Germany pay all damages in the war, regardless of which side it was on. Germany would pay, they were the losers especially for every lad last in, lost in combat. This would mean cash damages paid to virtually every British family since very few families were untouched by the horror of those years of war. On the other side of the channel was where the real damage took place though. France and Belgium, where the scene of the, they were the scene of the actual fighting during the war. Uh, they found vast stretches of their countryside just devastated by years of trench warfare. Fields, factories, mines, they all needed to be rebuilt return to production. Regardless of who was at fault, Germany lost, France won, Germany would pay. The big question was how much. Now Britain emerged from the war with a huge debt. This was part of what Keynes was negotiating and so on. To keep the machines of war going, he negotiated the debt. The money came to, to munitions makers and arms makers, especially in the United States, to pay for the weapons and so on. But the debt was enormous. It was $120 billion. 120 billion, that's nothing now, right? Well, in, a, in today's terms, that's $1.2 trillion of debt at the end of the war. And that was just for Britain. Um, most of that was due to U.S. banks, incidentally, and that, um, that was about, um, the, in fact, the, the, the annual interest payments on this debt alone was $6 billion, $72 billion in today's money. So who's going to pay for all this, especially how much? So Keynes, brilliant economist, we've established, he set forth his calculations. His first pass, excluding the actual loans and debts, direct damage to civilian populations, excluding the cost of pensions and payments to the war widows and families of dead soldiers, totaled about four billion dollars, uh, four billion pounds. That's about 200 billion in today's currency. Keynes figured maybe Germany could pay mm, three quarters of that. He settled on a more manageable figure of half that, about two billion pounds. 
about two billion pounds or about a hundred billion today. Um, that would have been paid in the course of tribute over a number of years. Um, but even this, it's necessary to remember, even this modest figure um, would only continue to rub salt in the wounds every time Germany had to write a check for that. They'd remember that they were the losers and they were being forced to pay tribute in this fashion. Uh, Keynes was not an economist. He was an economist, of course, not a social or political scientist. He didn't really even take consideration of that, at least not overtly, not right away. Eventually came to understand how important this was, but that's a few months later down the road. If Germany is to be milked, Keynes wrote in a report to the British Treasury, she must first of all, however, not be ruined, which is, of course, precisely what Clemenceau, the French Prime Minister, wanted. He wanted to ruin Germany. Germany was France's enemy for years, for decades. And it turned out he also had the, the longest memory of any Western leader assembled in Paris. In 1870, he was a young member of parliament, and he stood in front of the National Assembly, uh, just in front of the, across from the Place de la Concorde, and he was watched horrified as victorious German troops marched through Paris. And he vowed, never again. That's exactly what he vowed, never again turned out to be a prophetic phase, not only for him, for, for millions of other people in Europe, of course. What Clemenceau wanted was for Germany basic, basically to set France completely right, uh, like the war had never happened. Surely this might totally bankrupt Germany, but so what? To the victor belongs the spoils, right? So now to the Americans um, who found themselves on their way to Paris to negotiate some kind of a peace treaty. Um, they were led, of course, by our idealistic president, Woodrow Wilson. He arrived in Paris with none of this emotional baggage that his counterparts from Western Europe had. But we have to remember the principles that Wilson brought with him to these pre this peace conference. It's called the 14 points. They were the basis on which basically the United States entered the war and sent, it, sent its boys to Europe to face down the uh, German and Austro-Hungarian forces. Um, the core of this was not retribution, rather, but self-determination. In effect, democracy, call it whatever it wanted, what it really meant was, even though Wilson left himself a little wiggle room on that score, it was basically people taking control of their own lives and determining what kind of government, what kind of society they would have. Above all, Wilson wanted no part of destroying any nation or people beyond the damage that had already been done by those, all these years of bloodshed. His goal was healing, peace, so that there would never again be an excuse for war. But on the American delegation, there were others with very different agendas. Keynes's counterparts were several very distinguished bankers, lawyers, financiers. There was, for instance, a, a gentleman named Thomas Lamont. During the war, he looked after the interests of Wall Street and the Morgan Bank. Not necessarily in that order, by the way. Then there was John Foster Dulles, brother of Alan Dulles. He was a 30-year-old corporate lawyer at that point. Later on, he became very famous as Secretary of State and so on. But at that moment, he was just a young, um, a young gentleman who'd um, spent the war as an associate of a big white shoe New York law firm called Sullivan and Cromwell. They had represented German interests, commercial and banking interests, for decades. Dulles had every intention of using these peace talks to catapult him into a partnership in that firm that he believed he so richly deserved. And finally, there was a fellow named Norman Davis, a Tennessee gentleman. That's right, Tennessee, that's where he was from. He'd made his fortune as a trader with Cuba, though, after the Spanish-American War, and he then served as Assistant Secretary of the Treasury under, uh, under Wilson. Each had his own particular interests to look after. For Lamont, there was the huge debt that the Morgan Bank and other American financiers wanted to make sure would be repaid by whoever. Then there were the fancy fees that indeed loomed if, as Keynes expected, a host of long-term bonds would have to finance Germany's hefty reparations bill. They could get profits from that, the Morgan Bank, issuing these bonds. Finally, Germany would need some pretty pricey legal representation to watch out for its interests as the reparations process wound itself along. Sullivan and Cromwell, John Foster Dulles. <clears throat> there was at stake, though, more than just money. Germany was starving. Moreover, there were communists and communist cells just about everywhere. You have to remember, in 1917, communists came to power then. Uh, in, Euro in, uh, in, in Soviet Russia. Um, these communist cells were everywhere in Western Europe, especially in Germany. They were sowing unrest, discontent, riots, or worse. Um, so the question was, did the need for German stability and prosperity 
trump the desire for German reparations and the French paranoia over, still, over a still kicking and unquestionably hostile Germany on its eastern frontier. You know, you milk Germany, the people get upset, they turn to the communists. That's what they, people were worried about at Paris in 1919. In the end, however, it was greed that trumped everything. The settlement with Germany turned out to be as close to a Carthaginian peace, throwing salt across the land, um, as anyone could see, forcing down Germany's throat. In, in fact, at the end, Clemenceau was almost worried whether Germany would even sign the treaty at all. It was so horrendous. Um, it raised the specter, of course, then, of a resumption of the war that no one really wanted to resume. Nevertheless, the Germans did sign. Obviously, lots of people were working at very cross purposes. Even within the delegations, there was all kinds of conflicts and, and debate, uh, to the extent that finally, after months of frustration and fears that the treaty in the end would destroy not only Germany, but much of the Western world as well, came to both of the talks, said, to heck with that, I'm going back to London. Went back to London, a short time later, he published his first great work, The Economic Consequences of the Peace. I can tell you it was about this thick, tiny little book. He had it printed himself, in fact, in both in England and in America, at his own expense, and it caused an absolute storm. It was an enormous bestseller from day one. Um, it proved not only prescient, but also the foundation for his whole future reputation as one of the foremost economists of the 20th century. While all this was going on in Paris, there was a young house painter who had joined a Bavarian Freikorps devoted to suppressing the communist uprisings that were already spe sweeping Germany whose people were already on the edge of poverty, as we know, we just talked about, um, even starvation. The name of this house painter was Adolf Hitler. And he was as outraged by reports sweeping into, seeping into his homeland from the peace conference in Paris as Lenin was delighted by the signs of disarray and plunder that were finding their way to Moscow. Early on, Lenin recognized that the more rapacious the Allies became, the better a recruiting tool, a tool that might be in areas of Western Europe where he fervently believed communism would prove to be the ultimate winner. And indeed, in many of these nations, there was already a strong communist presence. He called, Lenin called the Versailles Treaty his greatest recruiting, recruiting tool. But it was only beginning to dawn on the West just how important an individual Lenin had become. Let me read you a brief passage from a shattered piece. Alan Dulles was late for a tennis game in the Swiss capital of Bern. 24-year-old who would one day become America's master spy, the patriarch of the American Central, Central Intelligence Agency, had just arrived by train from the U.S. mission in Vienna to take up his new post. And he'd run into an old friend from his school days, a buxom Swiss lass who played quite a passable game of tennis. Now he was at the U.S. legation in the Hirschengraben, seeing to his luggage, and was just closing up the office when the phone rang. The caller identified himself as a Russian revolutionary who needed to speak immediately to someone at the legation. Dulles insisted it was quite impossible and to ring back on Monday. Carlo insisted, urgency in his voice. Dulles refused, hung up abruptly, and went off to his tennis match. The next night, the Russian was sealed into a Swiss train with his comrades for the trip across Germany to the Finland station in the Russian capital of Petrograd. The caller was Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. How different the world might have been had, the, he had um, Dulles answered the call of the revolutionary rather than the call of the blonde. Dulles wondered barely two years later as he began packing his bags again, this time for Paris and the peace talks that were marked his true debut on the world stage. He'd wonder, in fact, m for much of the rest of his life and his career, and he continued telling that story about himself to new recruits at the CIA decades later, do not ever pass up an opportunity for a woman. In the interim, Lenin staged his revolution, murdered the Tsar and his whole family, came to power in Russia, and withdrew the country from the Allied side in the First World War. By 1919, Lenin was watching smugly, believing it was inevitable. Communism would sweep across Europe to the shores of the Atlantic, the inevitable and inexorable dialectic of history, as he called it. The reason Lenin had such hopes for the rapid victory of communism, particularly in Germany, was that the Treaty of Versailles effectively transformed this defeated power into a reparations machine. In fact, in several of its provisions, the treaty acquired almost comic opera status. Among its provisions, Germany should turn over to its conqueror, France, 500 stallions, 30,000 fillies and mares, clearly the men were worth a lot more than the ladies, at least in um, horse flesh, 
uh, 1,000 rams and 100,000 sheep, same issue, uh, 90,000 milk cows and 10,000 goats. Eventually, Germany was also forced to surrender 5,000 railroad locomotives and 150,000 rail cars and provide 7 million tons of coal each year for 10 years until French mines could be repaired. Finally, Germany was ordered to issue 60 billion gold marks worth of bonds immediately. Remember, the world was still on the gold standard until Keynes finally succeeded in getting them off it some years later. Um, more were to follow when the Allies determined that Germany was in a position to pay, but certainly 60 billion gold marks up front, huge amount of money in those days. Germany's other allies were treated no less gently. Bulgaria, who had the misfortune to choose the wrong side in the war um, with uh, Germany and Austria-Hungary, they were forced to surrender a quarter of their entire national wealth, and it never really recovered, even down to the present day, frankly. So the leader of the German delegation that wound up signing the treaty was Ulrich Graf von Brockdorf Ranzau, foreign minister of Germany. In fact, the same man who facilitated Lenin's passage across Germany on that sealed train that Dulles had ignored so long ago when he'd gone off to play tennis with the blonde. Um, Brockdorf Ranzau was horrified by the reparations, warning that those who sign this treaty will sign the death sentence of many millions of German men, women, and children from famine. Well, in fact, the first impact on Germany was inflation, which is a pretty mild term for describing what really happened. Hyperinflation is more like it. In the summer of 1920, the Deutsche Mark was being quoted at 254 to the pound, British pound. By 1923, it was 83,000 to the pound. Nine months later, it was 18 billion Deutsche Marks for one pound. In other words, by January 1923, the mark was worth 140 millionth as much as it was worth at the outbreak of World War I nine years earlier. In other words, in the streets of Weimar, Germany, they were issuing 50 million mark banknotes at one point, which were worth one pound. They were all but worthless within a matter of days, in fact. I, I, I want to show you something to give you an idea what hyperinflation means. This is a 10 billion dinar note, banknote, issued by the Yugoslav government in 1993, when they were in the middle of hyperinflation much later. See how many zeros there are on that? You know how much this was worth? It was worth a nickel. So that's hyperinflation. The result was um, people were starving um, in that time, and there was chaos everywhere. Money was all but worthless. Imagine the entire mighty nation of Germany reduced to even more desperate straits. What Keynes, and he was at the one time one of the very few who were that astute, was that the burden that the Allies set up in Versailles was only the beginning. The mechanism assured that every 15 years, the burden of reparations would double, so that by 1936, the overall reparations debt would explode to $65 billion, $963 billion in today's money, $963 billion. That's way more than even uh, Hank Paulson and George Bush's uh, bailout plan, which was $700 billion. In fact, projections at the time had Germany continuing to pay for another quarter century beyond that, until 1961, if they'd continue to honor that debt. Well, by the time of the October 1929 stock crash, Germany was already in near desperate straits. It got no better as the American Depression swept across Europe that had still not fully regained its footing after the war. By 1931, more than a third of all Germans were unemployed, 33% unemployment rate. We have something like six and a half people are talking, oh my God, it'll go up to eight and a half, maybe 10. 33% were unemployed, a third of every German, one, one out of every three Germans was unemployed. Um, by 1932, the Allies recognized what they had wrought in Germany and agreed to another conference reducing the German obligation to just $714 million, about 10 billion today. But that was too late. Six months later, January 30, 1933, Adolf Hitler was sworn in as Chancellor of Germany, risen from a house painter to a fighter in the Freikorps, and in 1933, the Reichskanzler. The new German Reichskanzler, what was his first uh, order of business? He reputed the entire, repudiated the entire Versailles Treaty, not to mention its provisions against German rearmament, which began immediately. Less than six years later, November 9th and 10th, 1938, yes, just 70 years ago this past weekend, Kristallnacht 
set the stage for the Holocaust as Hitler prepared to overrun Western Europe with his panzer divisions. There's one final and little known footnote to all of this, incidentally. In 1953, after the Second World War, <coughs> it was after the Iron Curtain had come down dividing the continent, the German nation also divided in two, a final international conference was held and determined that Germany would pay off its remaining debt only after Germany was eventually reunited, whenever that might be. That was in 1953. By 1980, a now prosperous West Germany, the West German government had paid off the entire principal. And in 1995, after the end of communism and the end of a divided Europe, after reunification of Germany, the new German government, now installed in a united Berlin, said it would resume payments of the interest on that debt of so long ago. So without the crushing burden of reparations and the Versailles Treaty imposed on Germany by the Allies, could this have perhaps gone differently in some fashion? Well, maybe. There were certainly political forces that were far more moderate in Germany than Adolf Hitler, who might have gathered strength. These other forces might have actually gathered strength in an economic recovery made possible by hard work that would rebuild their nation and, and so on, rather than simply produce profits that had to be shipped abroad to France, England, or America. <clears throat> again, back in 1919, it was Keynes again who'd been most prescient. Let me read you what he wrote. If we aim deliberately at the impover impoverishment of Central Europe, vengeance, I dare predict, will not limp. Nothing can then delay for very long that final civil war between the forces of reaction and the despairing convulsions of revolution, before which the horrors of the late German war will fade into nothing, and which will destroy whoever is the victor, the civilization, and the progress of our generation. If there's one message I'd like to leave with you on this 90th anniversary of the armistice that ended the First World War, it's this. The Carthaginian pieces don't work. They didn't work 2,000 years ago, they didn't work 90 years ago, and they won't work today. <clears throat> not in Iraq, not in Afghanistan, and especially against those who have been, we've been negotiating with or seeking to punish as enemies, Iran, North Korea, even Russia, especially since its invasion of Georgia. The entire so-called axis of evil, of evil, whose conception will be put to rest, hopefully, by the new Obama presidency. In, in so many ways, we have to let the world take its own path, whether it's prosperity or success. As I point out in my book, I'm confident that nations ultimately find their way to a government that they deserve and that works and is right for them and for their people. It can lead to peaceful and stable regimes and prosperity for everyone. I'd like to pause here and, and skip um, a couple of generations down to the present. Reverend White and, and Shia Bear so astutely suggested that I might quite appropriately, before I open this up to questions, um, that I, I really should examine how our nation, our world's economic crisis might affect the concept of peace in our time. This is what we're really talking about, peace, shattered or otherwise. In fact, today's global financial meltdown is unlike anything we've seen probably since the Great Depression I've been, de I've been describing. Hopefully we won't be printing any bills like this anytime soon, but you never know. Um, this was a more or less, the Great Depression was really an outgrowth of everything I've described in my book. And, and that said, I'd like to br talk, uh, talk briefly about two postulates. First, a Marshall Plan for the Middle East. The Marshall Plan, remember, was, um, um, well, the Marshall Plan was something that George Marshall, the Secretary of State, uh, at the end of um, the uh, Second World War, conceived as a means of rebuilding, of rebuilding Western Europe. Um, one of the pieces we have, um, it's a wonderful piece in our uh, 25th anniversary fall issue of the magazine I now edit, World Policy Journal, which explores the world as it might be 25 years from now, is a piece by a, a, a professor at Vassar um, who um, touches on just that scenario, a Marshall Plan now for the Middle East that would work its way out forward 25 years. It's an interesting concept, but we'd be forced to suspend some critical givens in the Middle East, in Iraq, and so on. No one country, for instance, could be favored over any other one. <clears throat> what that would mean, of course, is that Israel couldn't be favored over, say, Iraq or Saudi Arabia, for that matter, if it needed the funding, but principally Iraq or Lebanon. Um, the United States would be unable to force its own political views on any country receiving aid. Uh, 
That was another given of the first Marshall Plan in, in the 19, late 1940s. Um, has to come with no strings attached, all of this aid. And finally, and perhaps most important, this aid must not simply be a dole, a handout, but really build vibrant modern societies and economies in each of the countries that are receiving it. The price tag, unfortunately, for this Marshall Plan may be higher than even the developed West. Certainly the United States alone could afford in these difficult times. Which brings up the second of our postulates. What can we afford these days to help those who can't help themselves, especially countries in places like the Middle East and the developing world? And who therefore could pose a real threat if we don't help them to everything that we in the democratic West hold so dear. Last spring, I had a visit from Angel Gurria. He was the Secretary General of the Paris-based OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In, in effect, it's the club of rich nations. The US is a member, all of the, uh, uh, the Western developed countries and so on, Japan as well. Um, the economic crisis was just beginning to rear its head, although the scope and depth of it certainly wasn't clear back in the spring when I, when I saw him. Um, still, he told me he was on a swing of the principal members of the OECD, principal wealthy capitals, to nail down commitments of funding for projects in the developing world before it became too apparent that such resources would be politically unfeasible. Time was short, he said. Today it's probably non-existent. So what happens to these less advantaged nations and peoples given our current economic straits? The prospects are not, I'm afraid, are not encouraging. But the question is a central one. Can we afford to do the right, not to do the right thing now, or can we truly afford not to? Which brings us back to the message on this Armistice Day, 2008, perhaps the ultimate message of a shattered peace in Versailles as well. We must deal with other nations and other peoples as we wish they would deal with us. Only then can we hope for that peace to end all pieces that many of those statesmen who came to Paris so long ago aimed for and failed to deliver. And I hope you all have all these wonderful questions from all over the room. We have Mike down front. Um, Jeff's going to haul it out. And I'd love to answer the questions for them, from you. Yes, sir. The only reason you have to come up to the front is so everybody can hear you also, and um, I don't have to repeat it. Can, can people here in the back of the room, by the way? Good, okay. Yeah. What aspects of your role and life in Russia mm -hmm. are for you as an individual? And now I say black man in the Middle East. Now, which suggests to me, maybe I'm wrong, that money does not come by anywhere. Now, how, how did you deal with the, with the, Okay, uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because I have a whole chapter in my, oh, sorry. I'm not just that. <laughs> Okay. Well, you've, you've um, touched on um, one of my favorite chapters of my book, actually, uh, which I, I hope you'll have a chance to, 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 to examine. Um, f first, on, on um, money obviously can't buy peace um, anywhere. And, and in fact, that was one of the principal um, requirements of the Marshall Plan, that there no be, not be any ideology attached to it, and that it be parceled out evenly to those who really deserve to have it. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, uh, also back uh, in, in the spring, I believe it was in June, shortly before I left Forbes.com to come to the World Policy Journal, um, as Steve Forbes would have these uh, teas every now and then at his townhouse, and he'd have interesting guests. And, and one of them was um, the uh, Israeli finance minister, Ronnie Baran, 
So I came to that scene. There were about four or five of us sitting around chatting with him. <clears throat> and I gave him a copy of my book, and I said, um, and I explained to him the, the problems of how can you have, you know, in, in a country like this, an artificial nation, after all, that was carved up by the Balfour Declaration, effectively. Uh, how can you have uh, Jews and Arabs living this closely together like this um, and not expect some kind of an explosion, not expect, and expect to have any kind of a peace while they're so closely um, mashed together in, in one country? And he said, well, he said, we probably can't the way it's structured now. But his hope was, and he was trying to work this out, he was hoping to, um, that enough resources could be poured into the Palestinian community, and Israel was apparently devoting considerable resources to raising the standard of living of Palestinians all over Palestine and Palestinian lands, West Bank, um, Gaza particularly, uh, to the point where they could see, at least see themselves approaching a par with their Israeli uh, neighbors, whom they had envied for so long. Um, and he said, only can we get to, that, to get to that point, can we help the young people who are going into the streets now, throwing rocks and grenades and setting off bombs and so on, to understand that really development and a greater standard of living is the only thing that will really improve the quality of their lives over the long term. And only then will we really be able to live side by side with these communities. And I thought that was very interesting. It wasn't that, that, that money would buy peace, but it would be an enabler. It would help people understand that there is a way for them to have a better way of life. Uh, now, the second part, um, Germans hatred for, for the Jews. I think what we're really talking about is the rise of Adolf Hitler. And I tried to explain that a little bit in, the, um, in my um, little chat tonight. Um, Hitler was, was very clearly an anti-Semite from the beginning for a whole host of reasons I won't get into now. Um, that he was able to come to power was the colossal failure of the, uh, the 1919 peace, co peace Conference and the Versailles Treaty. Effectively, that brought Hitler to power, or at least it certainly did not enable forces that were opposed to Hitler and his brand of, of Nazi national socialism um, to take power. Uh, had the German economy been able to recover more dramatically, had they not, the country not been milked of its resources and so on, other forces might very well, political forces might very well have prevailed, and Hitler would have been marginalized in Germany. So I, I have many friends who are Germans, and I can tell you that most of my, none of my friends who are Germans are anti-Semites in that classic sense. Hitler distorted the entire social fabric of that time. But it wasn't just Hitler. Hitler was a product of, a, of an economy and a society that was not functioning, and at least to a very large extent, because of all the burdens put on it by its having lost the First World War. That's basically my thesis. Does that help? <laughs> well, I, I can't be any more clear than, yeah. Please, can you come up so others can hear you? Well, 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 you're going off the tangent here. But let's, let's deal with the first part first, Weizmann. I'm done, I'm done. Right. Okay, well, let, let me tell you a little bit about Chaim Weizmann, who's a very interesting um, individual. He, um, he came, of course, from the Pale of Settlements. He was born there in, um, in what was then Russia, portion of Russia. 
Um, he came, they studied in the West, studied in Germany and in uh, Switzerland, then came to England. Um, he was a brilliant chemist. Um, and in fact, he created several process, chemical processes, he invented several chemical processes that were an enormous help um, to the British side during the, uh, the war. This helped him get the kinds of introductions he needed um, to, um, to bring the, the Zionist cause to the attention of the, uh, the British government, and particularly, as you mentioned, Lord Balfour uh, and uh, Lloyd George. Um, they did the right thing. They set up a Jewish homeland, um, not necessarily directly as a quid pro quo for these chemical processes, but because it was the right thing to do. What I suggest and what I contend in my book is that they made an error, and the error they made was not understanding who was in the entire, in, in, in the Middle East, in the Holy Land at the time, that there were Palestinian Arabs and there were Jews. And not necessarily could they live peacefully among each other. What they really needed to do was to carve off a small portion of that territory, probably, for the Arabs, the Palestinian Arabs to live in, give the rest of the Jews as their homeland. Things probably would have worked much more smoothly. It's part of the whole fabric of errors that were a tissue of errors that were created by the peacemakers in 1919, the way they drew the boundaries. And I didn't get into all of that in this talk because we were focusing more on Europe and, and uh, Germany. But uh, Iraq today, for instance, contemporary Iraq was, um, and in fact I was asked about this on uh, News Channel 5, which you'll see on, in politics this weekend um, today. We taped it today. Um, Iraq was, was established as a nation by this very same treaty. The boundaries were drawn uh, in this, by this very same, by the peacemakers at, at Versailles. These are the very same boundaries that existed today. They had no idea that there were things called Kurd, people called Kurds and, and Sunnis and Shiites. They had no idea what these people were. And yet they put them all together in one country. That just doesn't work. It wasn't going to work then, it wasn't going to work now. Just to give you an example, the, um, uh, the principal advisor on the Middle East for uh, Wilson, he was the chairman of the, um, the Middle East Committee of what was called the Inquiry. That was sort of Wilson's think tank that he brought with him uh, to Paris uh, on, by the boat, on the boat. The chairman of the Middle East Committee was a Columbia University professor named William Westerman. Now, Westerman was an interesting fellow. Um, he was actually a specialist on the Crusades, which meant that his expertise in the Middle East ended somewhere around the year 1300 uh, with the Seventh Crusade. This was 619 years later. Um, obviously, there were things that were a lot different. They had no idea that this was what was happening, that these were the kinds of people that they were assembling into one nation um, in, the, um, in the Middle East. If, if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'll just read you the first few paragraphs of my book. Uh, which is, is kind of wonderful. It was spring in Paris, a brilliant Tuesday, May 13, 1919. At four o'clock, the city is still bathed in that crystal light that washes every building clean, even the aging but elegant townhouses in the city's fashionable 16th arrondissement. There on the Rue Nito, President Woodrow Wilson has gathered the leaders of the four victorious allies. World War I is over, and now these statesmen are remaking the world in their own image. The issue today is Iraq, carving what will become a new nation out of the sands of Mesopotamia. The brilliant young British diplomat, Harold Nicholson, has been cooling his heels in the anteroom, engrossed in the book The Picture of Dorian Gray, when suddenly a door flies open and he's summoned into the presence of the leaders. He picks up the story in his diary. Now, this is the same diary I read another passage of during the, in the talk. A heavily furnished study with my huge map on the carpet Bending over it, bubble, bubble, toil and trouble, are Clemenceau, Lloyd George, and P.W., that's President Wilson. They have pulled up armchairs and crouched low over the map. They are cutting the Baghdad Railway. Clemenceau says nothing during all of this. He sits at the edge of his chair and leans his two blue-gloved hands down upon the map. More than ever does he look like a gorilla of yellow ivory. It's appalling that these ignorant and irresponsible men should be cutting Asia Minor to bits as if they were dividing a cake. Isn't it terrible, the happiness of millions being discarded in that way? Their decisions are immoral and impracticable. These three ignorant men with a child to lead them. A child, I suppose, is me. Anyhow, it is an anxious child. That's how they divided up Iraq in that fashion. No idea what they were doing, crawling around on the floor uh, with a map and, a, um, and some fuzzy blue pencils. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. If you could, that would be helpful, I think, to everybody. 
I know it well. I lived seven years in France. Coach in China, coach in China as well. Well, well, certainly uh, there, there were many peoples who, who participated in the French struggles. Um, and, and you mentioned uh, the North Africans and so on, but there were, there were many others. Um, I have a section in my book that deals with uh, the Cochin China, for instance, um, which was, of course, a great uh, French colony. Uh, in World War I, um, the uh, Vietnamese, Cochin China sent a number of Vietnamese to, uh, to France. They didn't fight in the war, but um, they, they actually, they, Many of them um, worked in the factories and, and under horrendous conditions producing armaments and so on for the war so that the, actually the, the armaments makers, the, the, the traditional workers, could go to the front and be killed. Um, they expected at the end of the war that they would in some fashion be rewarded. Uh, and in fact, um, there was one young man, um, Nguyen Tat Tan, um, Nguyen who will succeed, if you will. He was a busboy in the Ritz. And he was in Paris in, um, in 1919. He'd come to Paris hoping to win some kind of respect or freedom, hopefully, for Cochin China, which was later Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos, but mainly Vietnam. Um, he drafted a thing called uh, the, 14, uh, the, the Eight Points, the Eight Demands, Huit Revendications. Um, and he tried to get this document. Um, it was patterned on the, our own Declaration of Independence, Wilson's 14 Points, and so on. He tried to get that um, um, before the American delegation, before the other delegations, and basically was given a back of his hand, their hand by each one of them. So um, he got very disillusioned when Tatan um, turned communist, uh, went off to Moscow eventually. 30 years later, took the nom de guerre of Ho Chi Minh. This was Ho Chi Minh, this young busboy who wanted freedom for um, Vietnam. Imagine if we had paid some attention to him back then. The whole rest of the 20th century history might very well have been very different. But there were stories like that from all of these many, many peoples that um, actually dealt with, um, that had some, some aspect, were, were in some fashion connected with the French empire, because it was a great, a big empire. Um, and, and none of these people really were properly, mm, shall we say, properly recognized, either after the First World War or even after the Second World War. Um, 
So, so commemorations, I think they're only useful if they understand the entirety of what's being commemorated and all of the peoples who sacrificed in some fashion um, to make this a better world, a better country, or make that country, help that country even survive for that matter. And, and all too often, I think, in these commemorations, we lose sight of really all of the peoples that, that need to be commemorated. And so you're absolutely right about that. We, we need to understand what commemorations really are and what they mean. Yes, ma'am. Well, first of all, um, you have to remember that, the, um, that millions of English lads went to um, fight Germany during the war, the First World War. So they, were, they had troops over there. Hundreds of thousands of young, young people were killed. In fact, almost an entire generation of, um, of, of uh, English uh, young men uh, were, 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 were killed during the First World War. It was, a, it was a huge catastrophe. Virtually every family was affected in some fashion. So although the war wasn't actually fought on, on English territory, it was certainly fought with English English blood, shall we say. Um, when Lloyd George ran for, um, uh, was, was re-elected as, as, as his government was, his government was re-elected just before the, um, the Versailles Conference began, his platform was, we will get something out of Germany <coughs> for every single uh, British family, English family. So that's the reason for all of that. Um, France, of course, had a much closer and more proximate um, excuse. They wanted to make sure that they were never overrun, their territory was never overrun again by Germany. But England felt it needed to, David, um, Lloyd George, the Prime Minister and the government, felt that they needed to exact that last pound of flesh, if you will. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> a whole host of things. There were basically um, two major empires, three major empires on the continent of Europe. There was um, Germany, there was Austria-Hungary. Um, further to the, um, to the east, there was um, the Ottoman Empire, which later came into the war. Uh, and on the opposite side, there was, there was the French Empire, there was England, and eventually the United States came into the war on the side of England and France. So um, really the approximate cause of the war was the, um, the assassination of an, arch, of an Archduke Franz Ferdinand, a, um, a young member of the, um, the Austro-Hungarian uh, ruling family in Sarajevo in the Balkans. Um, but really, the, the real excuse for it was um, a balance of power shifting that happened that began really 100 years earlier with the Congress of Vienna in 1815, and it had never gotten any better. Um, it was who was going to actually dominate Europe. Was it going to be Germany and Austria-Hungary? Was it going to be France and England? And that was the real conflict that ultimately touched off the war. Yes. Um, I think we'll have one more question, and that should do it. Ah, welcome. In, in part, I mean, I, there was no single causation here, but okay. Yes, he did. The Freikorps. It was it was the uh, the Freikorps he was a member of, and this was in Bavaria, right? 
Oh, oh there's no question about that. But, but you have to, but what is Germany? I mean, Germany was the society of Germany, which the, and the social fabric had really been, been shredded by the uh, economic travails it was going through at the time. I mean, the German economy was just was fractured and, and uh, flat on its back. And, and uh, you know, the, the conflicts within in Parliament had a lot to do with these uh, social issues and economic issues as well. The con conflicts between the, the socialists and the, um, and the communists. And the communists were, were a very powerful force then, uh, there's no question. In fact, this is one of the great fears of the, of the peacemakers in 1919 was that um, they would in fact, and that was uh, what I said, the greed finally triumphed, but they, they had this question, you know, if they pushed Germany too far, would that push in fact Germany into the hands of the communists? Um, in fact, it, it kind of began to do that. Um, and then Hitler came along, of course, his, his, um, his the Freikorp and the, and the other, um, uh, the, 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 um, his, his own um, paramilitary forces and so on that, that came to power. And so really it was, um, there, were, there were a whole host of social and economic reasons beyond simply the political squabbling within the, um, uh, within the parliament in Germany. Well, oh, well, okay, one more quick question. I may not articulate this very well, but I have some letters from 1923 and 1924 from both Poland and from Germany, mainly from Berlin, to talk about the economy. And these are from Jewish family members. And it talks about the economy and uh, the hyperinflation going on there. And so I have a question. Since a lot of Jews practiced usury back then, I just wondered during that time when people were so destitute and even like starving out in the streets and everything, like in Berlin, um, and uh, I had an uncle who was living there who was doing really well, so I don't know why he was doing really well in his business in like 1924, um, and he's passed away. I've never been able to ask him that mm -hmm. question. but. Um, so I was just wondering, do you think that use the usury that was going on among the Jews had something to kind of escalate the the anti-Semitism? And even today, well, I just came from... we're talking about 1923, 1924. Yeah. By then, there weren't very many Jews left in, in Germany. Um, you know, for the most part, um, they'd been victims of the Holocaust at that point. Um, so I'm not sure that there really would have been a yeah. huge um, you know, no, network. No, I said 20, 20, 1923. Right, 1923 was yeah, after. Holocaust. Oh, I'm sorry, Later. 1923. Yeah. Right, right. No, I just, I right. just came from Poland, and I, 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 I just in I so many conversations I with people, what you're the the anti-Semitism, the xenophobia is still so strong. Well, well, Ger oh, Germany, oh, the, the German Jewish community certainly before the the, um, the the Second World War was was a very was very involved in in, in finance and banking and and, and so on. Um, there's no question about that. I mean, look, there was a lot of a lot of social and, and political tension that was going on, there's no question. Um, but would these forces, the question, and I raised this question um, at some length in my book, would these forces, in fact, ever have gotten to the point where they could have dominated Germany and resulted in the rise of someone like Hitler if the economy had been better off? Would, for instance, users have been necessary if Germany had rebuilt a strong economy so that they wouldn't be needed? Look, when we have hyperinflation of the kind that was going on in Germany in the 20s and 30s, um, you know, that hyperinflation is a, is a, a terror, it's like, almost like a cancer. Um, no one can survive during that period, uh, in, in a situation like that. And people always look for scapegoats. Unfortunately, the, the Jewish community in, in Germany at that time was very often scapegoats. Um, so the question is, though, if we were a stronger economy, stronger society, would people have been forced to look for scapegoats? And I suspect not. Thank you. It's a great book. And we got a great magazine too. <laughs>